Hi everyone, and welcome back to English 2 for our first sort of content video. So in our last video, sort of a welcome to the course, here's some of the things you want to pay attention to in the syllabus. Um, so today we're actually going to talk about literature and about reading and about specifically one of the most major tools in the sort of English toolbox, which is something called close reading. And it's not limited just to us, uh, definitely other disciplines use it. You may hear similar uh, humanities disciplines talk about close reading and things like communication studies and such. But, uh, but definitely it is one of uh, the kind of mainstays of, of literary analysis is a way of reading called close reading. So what is close reading? As you might expect from the name, it does in fact involve reading closely. Um, that said, it's not just paying attention to what you read, because really that's just reading. Um, specifically, it's reading it closely in a particular way. Um, specifically, close reading tends to involve looking at a text and specifically looking at what is going on underneath the surface of the text, underneath the surface reading. Um, if there is a text, then there is a subtext. Um, so the text is what is actually being said, the subtext is what is being meant or implied. It's not actually being said, but nevertheless it's there. Now one of the issues a lot of people have with uh, literature is the idea that we we read into things, we read in things that aren't there. And that definitely can be an issue, as, as we'll talk about uh, a little later, but we also often will read things in that are there. And what is the difference? Um, it's going to involve being able to support our reading with evidence. Um, and in the case of something like close reading, um, we know that it's possible to say things and not have them be exactly what they appear on the surface. We have entire, you know, levels of humor devoted to that. Things like sarcasm. The whole point of sarcasm is that you say one thing, but you mean something else. Um, any kind of use of body language will often also modify uh, what someone is actually saying. So, for example, if you go to a friend and you, you ask them how they're doing, um, and their response is, I'm fine. Okay, then, great, they're doing fine. If they say, I'm fine, your immediate response is going to be, are you sure you're okay? Sure you're fine? If you take these two interactions on the surface, they're the exact same. You ask someone what, how they're doing, and they say they're fine. We don't treat those two interactions the same way, and for obvious and good reason, because those two interactions are clearly not meant the same way. So close reading is essentially the textual analysis of that kind of body language reading, or, or something like sarcasm, where again, you know, so I say, how are things going? They're great. Obviously, they're, they're, they're not going so great if you're saying it like that. Um, so. Um, close reading is basically looking at the surface of a text and figuring out what it is based on that surface that we can figure out is going on underneath the surface. Um, what kinds of unspoken or unwritten communication are going on in addition to the things that are explicitly being, being stated. So, um, again, keep in mind, we're not just reading things in. Um, in, the, in the, both of those cases, we have particular things we can point to that are evidence that we should maybe be reading those things differently than, than we'd expect, that we shouldn't be taking them on, on surface meaning. Um, in both of those cases, it is something like tone of voice. That's how we tend to communicate that kind of meaning in, in spoken English, in spoken language. But, uh, but certainly we can do similar things in, in text. Um, if a character says something, but everything we've seen them do previously suggests that they actually feel the exact opposite, then we might interpret that as that character being sarcastic and not actually meaning that. 
and we can point to all of their previous conduct as evidence. So, um, that said, I did point out that reading in things can be an issue, um, and so, um, so it is possible to read things in that aren't there. Um, and part of this is because um, everyone reads differently. Um, we have to because we're all different people and we're coming to our text with different experiences and different personalities and different you know, ways of interacting with texts. And so we're gonna interpret these texts probably at least a little differently um, because we always bring whoever we are to whatever text we're reading. Um, and we have personal responses to those texts. Um, and often that's a goal. Like often texts want to make you feel things. But it's important to keep in mind what are the things that we bring to the text and what things does the text seem to be including in itself. Um, so what is it that we bring to the text that is helpful, um, which is often going to be analytical skills, or possibly an interesting perspective that might make us in interpret the evidence differently. And what are the things we bring to the text that are unhelpful, which are often going to be uh, taking our own sort of uh, feelings and putting them into a text that maybe doesn't support that. So it's a great example. Um, I'm going to link a, a video on, on Blackboard and also uh, in the uh, probably in the uh, description of this video if I can if I remember to, um, but if not, it'll be on Blackboard. Uh, to the Pharrell song Happy. And if you've heard it, that's great. If you haven't, uh, feel free to go click on the link and, uh, and go check it out. So, uh, I'll give you a minute to do that. Feel free to just pause and flip over to another tab and do that. Okay, so, so you've watched the video. Um, so, how would you describe this song? What do you think it's supposed to make you feel? The response you're probably giving is happy and with reason. Um, you have a lot of evidence you can point to, starting with the title of the song. Like, it doesn't have to mean that. It could have been in our, our sarcastic title, uh, but it doesn't seem to be like everything else in terms of the, the music of the actual, like, beat and, you know, uh, melody, uh, the lyrics, uh, in the case of the music video, the way that people are acting, all seems to kind of support this idea that this song is about being happy. So, Let's say you have an ex, and this ex was an asshole. And this ex, whoever they were, they loved this song. They loved to sing it, they played it on repeat. Um, and so now every time you hear this song, you think of that ex and you think, oh, that fucker. You feel angry when you hear this song. That is a totally valid understandable personal response. Um, like you have these experiences with the song, it makes you feel a certain way, and like that seems reasonable based on the experiences you've had. Does that make this an angry song? Even if it makes me, means you feel angry listening to it? Not necessarily. That's something that you're bringing to the song, but it's not necessarily something that you can really make a really good case is there in the song already. There's not much you can point to to support that in the song. So personal responses are fine. They're often not necessarily going to be always to things that are actually there in the text. In this case, it has nothing to do with the song itself. It has to do with your experiences with a person who really liked this song and who you associate the song with. So personal response, we generally want to keep that out of the way when we're doing analysis, when we're doing close reading. This can be hard. Because, again, we're human beings with, you know, feelings. And uh, if every time you hear this song, it enrages you. Um, it may be hard to think of this as a really just happy song. Uh, but nevertheless, clearly there are things that we can support saying about the song and things that we can't. So saying this is an angry song, we can't really support that with anything outside of your personal experience. There's only about the song itself that suggests that. Saying this song to make you feel happy, that we can support. There's a lot of stuff we can point to in the song, in the video, that helps us support this idea. So clearly there are 
things that you can support and there are statements you can make about a song or any kind of text in close reading that you can back up. And those are the kinds of things we want to get to when we do close reading. So personal response, great way to respond personally to a text. Um, not what we want to be doing when we're doing close reading. Like it's great to feel things, um, but when we do this, we want to make sure it's something that uh, we can convince other people of. And it's really difficult to convince someone else that this is an angry song by, you know, saying my jerk of an ex used to like this song. It's a lot easier if you can point to things in the song itself to support whatever you're saying. Uh, another thing that close reading is not is BSing or fanciful theorizing. Um, sometimes folks get by, especially I've noticed in high school English, um, by being able to come up with deep sounding, but basically kind of empty and unsupported things to say about a work. Um, the biggest, uh, the ones of these I, I see most often are, everyone was dead all along. And uh, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Um, these are these are statements that people often make about about texts, and they sound profound. They sound deep. Um, they're often really difficult to back up, though, or to back up in any meaningful way. Everyone was dead all along. Um, can you point to like reasons, um, things that suggest that in fact everyone is dead, and that this is you know purgatory or heaven or whatever? Um, like, if you can't come up with any really good support for that idea, it's going to be really difficult to make that case. Similarly, the idea that a, a story is about how you can't judge a book by its cover. And we'll talk about, about this more later on when we get to theme, but is it actually like what the story is about, or is it just that in the story at some point things are not what they seem? Um, yes, that does sort of involve not judging a book by its cover, but also involves like just about everything from that your fine interaction to close reading to uh, to the straight up lying. Like, there's a lot of things that are just not as they appear on the surface. They're not entirely straightforward. That doesn't mean that's what that story is about. So um, specifically for the purposes of this course and for really any English courses, um, you want to make sure that when you're close reading, the things that you're saying about a text um, are based on objective textual facts. Like there are actual things in the text you can point to and say, here, based on this, here's why I think X is actually true, or this is why I think X is happening. You don't have to use just things in the text. Often bringing in outside context can be, can be interesting and helpful, um, but you do have to be basing it around something that is there in the text. And ideally, if you're uh, saying something coherent about the text, you're basing on actual things in the text, um, that any reasonably sensitive reader of a text can understand it. They may or may not agree with it. They may or may not agree that you fully supported it, but they can at least be like, I can see why someone might think that. Like, th there is support for it. Uh, sometimes this can be things that people missed on the first read. Sometimes this can be things that people uh, because they're coming to a text with a different background, uh, it comes across very differently to a reader. Um, again, this is to some extent personal response, but it can also be specifically things are meant to come off in a couple different ways. Um, and depending on your experiences, you're more likely to interpret in way A or way B. Um, in general, close reading, when you're t telling someone else about your close reading, it should be like a mystery novel. Your reaction when someone's like laying it all out for you at the end should be, oh, that makes sense now that I think about it. The reaction should not be, what? So keep in mind, you want to get that Hercule Poirot, like end of the mystery novel, ah, oh, it all makes sense now feeling, or at least, you know, oh, I see how you got there. What you don't want is your audience to be like, what are they smoking? That means you probably did not do a sufficient job of convincing them, or at least making it seem reasonable that this could be convincing. 
So, um, that's kind of what close reading is not. The way close reading is, um, it is, or another thing that it's not, I guess, that to be paired with something that it is, it is not some kind of magical thing or something that's required to be some kind of inborn talent. Close reading is a skill, like any other. And like any skill, it has strategies you can learn. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. So, uh, how do we do close reading? Um, how do we read into that text to figure out what that subtext under the surface is? So, I tend to like a sort of three-step process. Um, but in general, uh, this is how you're going to read within a text to find things that are implied or unsaid and nevertheless are still being communicated. Step one is understanding. This is surface reading, which is basically prep for the actual close reading. In order to understand the subtext, you have to understand the text. Uh, you have to walk before you can run, and you have to hit the surface before you can go under the surface. So the first step is to actually understand a text's surface meaning. This is going to involve things like summary, things like paraphrase, um, like often your first read through through a text is going to be primarily on this understanding level, just because like you got to understand what it's saying before you can understand what it's implying. All the evidence that you're pulling on for what is being implied is still going to re rely on what's actually being said. So first step, understand the service meaning. In a novel, this is going to be like, what is the plot? Who are the characters? What are the things that, you know, objectively happen in the story? Um, like, you kind of need to know these things before you can figure out what's, what's going on on a deeper level. So once you've got that sort of shallow surface understanding, step two is going to be noticing. So this is going to be noticing things that seem unusual to you in some way, that jump out at you in some way. Um, this will definitely be easier as you read more things looking for, for subtext. You'll notice that there are certain things that you tend to notice more often. But, uh, but in general, if when you're reading you have questions about why a character did something, or something seems not like it might appear on the surface, um, if there's something where you're like, that seems like it's important even if I'm not sure why. Um, all of these are things that you can maybe pick up during this noticing step. Um, there's particularly interesting word choices where you're like, hmm, that's a word I wasn't expecting there. Um, that's going to count as, as noticing. If a character does something, you're like, why did they do that? That doesn't make sense based on what we've seen of them before. That's probably something you should notice. Um, might be good fodder for close reading. Uh, anything that jumps out at you, anything that seems unexpected, anything that is not as it appears, um, or anything that you feel might be important but you're not maybe 100% sure why, or it might seem important from something that is not on the surface. Um, all that stuff, prime material for close reading. This is why it can be really helpful when you read to take notes. Um, it can be really difficult often if you're especially reading like a novel or something. So you're thinking, be like, what were those things I wanted to look at back in chapter three? Um, so this is why I'd say it is often really helpful to take notes as you read. Um, just jot down those things that you notice that you think might you might want to remember or might be worth looking at in more depth and detail in the future. I would say for us in this class, it's best to start off with micro-level choices. Um, so these are things like word choice or punctuation, a particular character's action in a scene or a particular scene, um, rather than high-level things like a plot or like a like something that's overarching and applying to the entire plot. Um, especially for a new close reader, the bigger scale and more of a text something encompasses, the more likely it is going to lead to summary and paraphrase rather than analysis. So if you want to analyze, say, um, just as a for instance, uh, as a recent blockbuster movie, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, um, you probably don't want to start off by trying to uh, say something about like the entire plot, 
because it's going to be really easy to get sidetracked into just recounting the plot. It's going to be a lot more, a lot easier to say something meaningful um, and to have something really interesting to say about this story if you focus on a particular kind of sub area. That could be a particular scene. That could be a particular character. Um, that could be a particular, uh, like, in the case of a movie, obviously there's a lot of other things we can look at that are part of the text, um, like, you know, the use of color and costuming and casting and directorial angles and things like that. Um, a lot of things that, you know, we don't necessarily get in, a, in an actual text text. But, um, but nevertheless, um, any of those specific kind of sub-areas is a much better thing to focus on than here's what Shang-Chi is really about um, because it's going to be really easy to that for that to just kind of devolve into and here's what happens in Shang-Chi which is not going to be helpful it's not going to really get any kind of analysis if you're saying the character of Shang-Chi is really interesting and here is why uh, based on the way he acts in these three scenes that's going to be something that is nice really well so and really well supported because you have specific scenes specific moments you can point to and say here's why i think x because in this scene uh shang chi says this to his friend katie or in this scene shang chi interacts with his dad in this way and someone can in fact then go back and watch shang chi and see those scenes and be like yeah they're right um so the more focused the thing you're focusing on is, the more specific and narrow, uh, the better it is going to be for analysis. Uh, which is not to say you can't make those bigger statements, uh, but in general you want to work up to those. It's a lot easier to make strong arguments and have strong evidence to support something that is very kind of smaller scale and focused. This is also why poetry is a great place to start. And where we're going to start, because poetry, um, especially lyric poetry, which is the kind that you know does not necessarily uh, like the poet equivalent of a novel or story, like something like the Odyssey, um, something that's more like a, a mood piece or you know talking about emotion. Um, those sorts of things are going to work really well for this, because you can't get distracted by things like plot or like major characters, go their stories going throughout the entire story because there is no story and plot or if there's a story it's it's a very sort of implied one um so we're going to start off uh with our our noticing and and close reading uh with a poem so we've had two steps one understanding surface reading getting to know what the text actually says noticing which is beginning to go under that surface noticing moments where the text might not be saying what it actually says. Um, it might be, uh, it, but, but clearly that something draws us to these moments, to these words, to these scenes, to these actions. And even if we're not on a conscious level thinking, you know, I bet here's what's going on, if it seems significant to us, like at some level our brain is thinking, there's something going on here. So pay attention to that when when it happens. If, if instinct tells you this is important, go with that instinct. Um, it may or may not be important the way you think it might be, but chances are it probably is important. Then we have our final step, our third step, which is explaining. So in our second step, we found these things, all these things that are interesting, that seem unusual or unexpected, or in some way like they could potentially lead to some kind of subtext. This is great. So. What is the subtext for those things? Why are these things significant? Why are they important? How can we explain them? Um, and as you might expect, that's what you do on the explaining step, is you explain why these things are important, why they're noteworthy, what they're actually saying. A few things to keep in mind here, remember you're not trying to communicate what the author definitely meant to do. Um, we can't really do that because like, we're not mind readers and also a lot of our authors are dead. Uh, we can't ask them. So uh, the most we can say is this is what the author might have been trying to do. This might be what they meant to do. Um, but in general, it's, it's really difficult to say, you know, um, here's what Jane Austen meant by this. Um, because, like, 
Jane's dead, we can't ask her. Uh, so the most we can do is, like, maybe she wrote about it and said, here's what I meant to say. That's great. Um, again, just because someone means to say something doesn't mean that's what they're actually saying, but it's, it's, it's a good piece of evidence. Uh, and also, uh, like, because we can't ask her, uh, again, the most we can say is basically, here's my, this might have been what she's doing, or this might have been what she meant to do. Because A, we can't ask her, B, even if we could, she might not be 100% truthful, either intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes uh, we can be very uh, self-deceiving, self even as authors. We might think we're writing about X, but actually we're writing about Y. Uh, so... These are our three steps. Understanding, noticing, explain. In this class, we're going to probably be mostly spending our time uh, on the noticing step, uh, moving into that explaining step when it comes to specifically our, our, our major writing assignments, usually. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's going to be figuring out how to notice these things, practicing noticing things, and maybe getting to some early stages of that explaining step. So maybe uh, thinking about why the author might have done these things, what effect this might have on the reader, these sorts of things. So uh, now we've kind of talked about what close reading is, um, it might be good to kind of model some. So for today, we're going to look at a very short poem by Margaret Atwood. Um, and I will have it linked on Blackboard. But I'll also just read it aloud because it is very, very short. Um, so, uh, the poem is called You Fit Into Me. Author is Margaret Atwood. And uh, this is, the poem goes as follows. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. A fish hook, an open eye. So take a few minutes to kind of just think about, about that poem. If you need to, open it up on Blackboard and, and look at it there. And just look at it a couple times and... Think about uh, what is it saying on the surface, and what are those things that jump out at you, that you notice, that you think about, that seem like they are important or have a lot of meaning, um, and then, you know, come back. Okay, so, this will be your back now. Um, so, hopefully you notice some stuff about this poem that seems interesting, that seems unusual, that jumped out at you. Um, and I will kind of walk through a reading of this. Um, keep in mind, these are the things that I've noticed. Uh, you may notice things that are entirely different, especially if you're coming at this from a different perspective than I am. For example, like, I have never been fishing in my life. Um, like, there may be a bunch of, like, really interesting things that you notice as someone who actually uses fish hooks that I would not notice, having never actually used one. So this is this sort of situation where um, you're not necessarily bringing personal emotion to a reading, but personal experience can nevertheless help you bring something new to the text that other people might not have. Um, like clearly, explicitly mentions a fish hook um, that may hit very differently for someone who's used to using those, as opposed to someone like me who has never used one. So looking at things on the surface first, you fit into me, first line. Okay, seems, seems good. Um, when we talk about things fitting, we tend, usually tend to mean that they fit well. Um, like they fit in, uh, we talk about close fit, we mean that they fit well. If we say something's a good fit, again, um, or, or, or uh, if we uh, ask how something's fitting, um, like the assumption if we use fit is that it's good. If it's not going to be good, we have to explicitly say that. Like if you say, like you say, this is a bad fit, or this isn't fitting well, um, I don't like the way this fits, um, those kind of things. But if you just say, it fits, we're assuming it fits well, a positive version. So you fit into me, first line, pretty happy. Um, seems like maybe it's kind of a romance kind of thing, perhaps, but certainly it's, it's two people, presumably, and in some way, literally or metaphorically, they fit. Second line, like a hook into an eye. 
And this is one of the situations where, uh, depending on the context you're coming to this story with, or to this poem with, uh, you may interpret this in a couple of different ways. Um, and it's going to depend on how familiar you are with something called a hook and eye fastener. Um, very common way of fastening clothing up until probably like the, certainly until the like 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, nowadays we don't tend to use them very much. They tend to be using like things like doll clothes and bra straps primarily. Um, but a hook and eye is like you have the eye, like I have a needle, and you have a hook, and the hook goes in the eye. Um, so, and obviously they do that. Oh, so you like jewelry clasps will often use, use hooks and eyes. So this poem was written in like the 1970s, and for audiences of the 1970s, um, their immediate as association with this line would have been, oh, like a hook and eye fastener. Um, for modern audiences, who do not know really hook and eye fasteners, and even if they've used them in things like bra straps, uh, they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily know that they're called that. Um, they may think that it's like a hook and like an eye, which it is actually, as the poem tells us. Um, but probably in the 1970s, um, it was a twist. Like the second line would have been a happy line. Like, oh, you fit into me like a hook into an eye like a hook into an eye fastener, like two things that are made for each other, like, like a key into a lock, like a button into a buttonhole. So it's that sort of idea. Um, so first two lines, happy. Like this seems like a good relationship between these two people. And then the third and fourth line clarify. That it's not a hook and eye fastener. It is a fish hook and an open eye. And Obviously, a fish hook into an open eye is a less good mental image. Uh, that is not, that's not happy. That, that, that's not a good fit. That is uh, painful and damaging and, like, bad. So, on the surface, here's what we have going for it. Uh, you fit in me like a hook into an eye, happy, a fish hook, an open eye. Oh, let's do a twist and went really bad. Um, that said, there's a lot more that we can we can talk about with this poem. For one thing, we can talk about things like context. Um, modern audiences who don't use hook and eye fasteners, for us that, that twist may have come a, a line before. Like the first line is happy and then the after ones that are all are all a nightmare. Um, but if we look at this line by line, we kind of started to do a little bit of noticing and kind of uh, focusing on things that are important with, with my discussion of the fit in that first line. Um, so, fit being good, if you don't clarify otherwise, um, that's, that's the beginning of close reading. We're starting to notice things. Um, fit into. So, a person fitting into another person. There's a lot of things this brings to mind. Um, one of them is, you know, penetrative sex. Um, so, uh, we may or may not Think of this as like a romance. Um, certainly, uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, there's nothing explicitly says that these are, you know, lovers. But but certainly, it doesn't say that they're not. And the idea of someone fitting into another person as part of a relationship does tend to bring to mind sex, and uh, and maybe supports the idea that this could be a romantic relationship. Um, so, we're already seeing some things in this first line where things aren't being said, but they might still be being said anyway. Again, we can't necessarily 100% say for sure, but this certainly maybe might lead us to go in one or the other direction. Line two, like a hook into an eye. Again, we've got that hook and eye fastener, um, and specifically the idea that these two things are made for each other, like they're meant to fit inside each other. Um, like I said with the examples of the Lock, uh, lock and key or button and buttonhole. Um, but there's also, uh, again, uh, they fit into each other, you know. The, again, you could take a sexual reading of that. Um, like you have, you know, something that protrudes and you have something that goes into. Um, again, don't necessarily have to do that, uh, but 
that could be a way that you would read that and the text would, would support that. Um, it also tends to be, like hooks and eyes tend to be, be associated with things like clothing, um, jewelry, uh, things that tend to be seen more like domestic and private. Um, like we don't tend to see them used on like coats very often, which are something that we only wear outside. Um, so again, this might suggest that it's a sort of more uh, intimate private type relationship, whether that's, you know, romantic, whether that's family. Like this is probably not, you know, a relationship between like co-workers who are, are distant acquaintances. Then we have our twist, a fish hook and an open eye. A fish hook, that brings a lot of things to mind. Um, again, it probably brings things to mind more if, you know, you're, you're not, if you are familiar with fish, fishing. Um, I'm not, uh, but I am familiar with the English language, and we use a lot of fishing kind of language and metaphors when we talk about relationships, um, whether romantic or otherwise. Um, like, you know, the most recent, newest one probably is things like catfishing, um, but you know, the idea of there's plenty of fish out in the sea, um, talking about uh, giving someone on the hook for something. Um, there's uh, keeping someone on the line. Uh, th 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 there's a lot of different, you know, fish metaphors, only some of which are coming to mind. But we need to keep in mind with all of these metaphors, um, all of these kind of figure of language comparing a relationship to, to fishing, is that in all of these, it's likening it usually to a fish and a fish. Fisher person. Um, and in general, that's not a super equal relationship. And those ways of talking about relationships tend not to be super positive. Um, because, like, um, if, the if you're comparing the relationship between, between the relationship between a fish and someone who's fishing, uh, that doesn't work out super well for the fish. And you don't you don't want to be the fish in that in that sort of comparison. Um, so we definitely use fishing writers to talk about relationships, but often not necessarily good ones. So this maybe kind of tracks with that because we're definitely seeing how this has gone to a very bad place very quickly. Um, an open eye again, the fact that a it's not just like telling us there's a human eye, um, or like a, 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 an, an eye as like the body part, as opposed to the eye as in the hole in, 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 a, in a like metal catch. Um, presumably human, but not necessarily. Um, the fact that it's open, though, um, tells us, suggests some other things. Um, what do we associate with open eyes? Well, for one thing, it's vulnerable. Like, eyelids exist to keep dirt and, you know, grit and, you know, harmful things out of our eyes. Um, obviously, uh, it is not going to do a ton in the case of a fish hook goat to your eye. But, uh, but nevertheless, the fact that the eyelid isn't even in the way says that this eye is completely vulnerable. Uh, whether it was a fish hook or like a grain of sand, it's going to get in there and not good things are going to happen. Also, we tend to associate open eyes with things like being able to see clearly. Um, if you say you're going into something with eyes open, uh, it means that you're going in knowing the score. You're knowing what's happening. So maybe this is suggesting that the person who, the equivalent of the person who, you know, is having the fish hook in their eye, um, went into this knowing that this is where it was going to end. Or you just meant that like they saw it coming but weren't able to avoid it, but in some way it has this connotation of like seeing clearly, um, and in some ways that might make it better. In some ways that might make it worse. Like, is it better to actually see the fish hook coming for your eye? I don't know, but definitely it, it's not great. So that is kind of like the fact that it is open make us maybe have those associations with it. Again, 
Um, there's a lot of different, a lot of other things we could look at with these if we went, wanted to go through it word by word, wanted to go through it like image by image, um, look at how the particular lines tie in with other lines. Um, nevertheless, like I have said a lot, and this poem is like 16 words, I think, um, and it's four lines. Um, and I've said a lot more than that. And you probably have some stuff that I didn't get around to talking about, either because I just didn't get around to it, or because I didn't notice it myself, because I'm coming at this from a different place of experience than you are. So, um, this is kind of getting of how you, you notice things, and from here we could start trying to explain something about this poem. We probably want to focus on a particular kind of sub-aspect of this poem to make a, a case about. Otherwise, things might be a little scattered. But if we wanted to say something specifically about, you know, uh, how the use of fishing language in relationships makes this poem hit harder or makes it seem more painful, um, that's something we could, we could support based on the things that I've talked about. Um, and again, you might think, how could you come up with, like, an entire paper on, like, you know, a single three-word line. Um, well, I've already talked a lot about these 16 words, um, and uh, I will tell you, as someone who's been a long-time English person, um, there are folks who have done entire, like, scholarly articles and chapters on, like, a single word in, a, like, a major literary text. So, uh, depending on how deep you want to dive, how far in you want to go, uh, you can you can find a lot, and you can have a lot to say. Um, and as long as you can support it uh, by pointing to things that are actually there in the text, um, even if you need external help to, to kind of arrive at that point, as long as the evidence you're pointing to is there, um, then you're probably going to be fine. So uh, that's kind of a, a brief postage stamp uh, introduction to close reading. Um, a few things to keep in mind, uh, the importance of context, like if you know what a hook and eye fastener is, this is going to come off uh, differently than if you don't. Um, and specifically, it's something that's very different in 1970s Canada when this was written versus 2020s America. Um, the importance of the audience and what they know. Um, again, an audience who knows fishing will come across may have very different things to say about this than someone like me who doesn't. Um, and there's also a lack of control on the author's part over who eventually reads the text. Like, Atwood was really presumably writing this for folks in the 70s. Um, she was probably not figuring, like, she might have hoped, but she probably wasn't expecting people in, you know, 2022 Lawrence, Kansas, to be reading her poem and coming at it from a very different place than her readers at the time. And yet, that's what happened. So, um, whether she wanted it to happen or not, it did. So, once an author has written it and published it and put it out there, uh, they, to some extent, give up some semblance of control. Like, it's just the way it happens. So, um, hopefully you have a better idea of close reading, like kind of why it's important, what it is, uh, what it isn't, and kind of how to do it. Um, and then we've kind of done a brief walkthrough through at least the first couple of, of phases and kind of moving into the third. Um, so for next week, um, we'll be having an assignment due, and I will be uh, putting that on Blackboard. Um, it's a very short assignment, um, and it's going to be the autobiography of a reader-writer. Um, and that is basically going to be you talking about who you are as a reader, like what has made you the reader that you are, what kind of reader you are, um, what things you like to read, what things you don't like to read, etc. And the same for you as a writer. Um, and I've got a nice long list of you know questions for each half of that prompt um, on the assignment sheet page. So uh, the deadline for that will be the end of next week, so the end of a week from Sunday. Um, and obviously you can still turn it in after that, but that's just, I would recommend you get it in by the end of next week. That's the recommended deadline. Um, 
Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, but uh, the assignment sheet is there on the on Blackboard. So take a look at that first, and then you'll have a pretty good idea, hopefully, of uh, what it is that I'd like you to do. But keep in mind, it is short, it is informal. Um, don't stress too much over it. Um, don't try to like fuss over it and make it perfect. Um, I'm not grading it on you know your writing skills, necessarily. I just want to get an idea of where you are as a writer, and also uh, get an idea of like where we are as a class in terms of the things we like to read, the things we don't like to read, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then next week we will uh, be doing our sort of introduction to literature, um, or not introduction to literature, introduction to fiction specifically. And I believe we will also be doing our introduction to poetry next week. Right. Yes. So we'll be doing uh, introductions to both fiction, and poetry, um, and we'll be introduced to fiction with another uh, Margaret Atwood piece, um, specifically her story *Happy Endings*. And we'll be introducing to ourselves to poetry uh, with a poem by the poet Elizabeth Bishop called *One Art*. Uh, those are both up on Blackboard already. So, uh, for, the, for as far as this video goes. Um, Take a look at the autobiography of a reader writer assignment. Um, try to get that done at some point within the next week and change. Um, and be ready for our next uh, video in which I will talk about, kind of walk us through an introduction to fiction. And then after that, uh, you'll want to uh, to go into happy endings for, for our discussion. But um, for now, the thing I do before the next video is look at that autobiography of a reader writer assignment um, and maybe start on that if not finish it completely also if you have not had a chance to look at the syllabus uh, feel free to do that you will want to do that at some point um, so that's it for now um, i will see you all in the next video and have a good weekend